today is the first and the second segment of the structural instruction. The first segment, this one, is Introduction to Building Codes. Uh, I will present it. You see the name here. Uh, I am the team leader for Component S9 uh, that we have talked about. Uh, the other detail that I, I think I probably should spend a, a, a few seconds on, the uh, project Component S9 was awarded to a joint venture of the International Code Council and Smart Development Engineering of Dhaka. Uh, SK Ghosh Associates is a wholly owned subsidiary of the International Code Council. We have been involved in the business of continuing education, particularly of structural engineers for 23 years. These seminars are being organized and presented by uh, SK Ghosh Associates uh, for the joint venture just so that this detail is clear to everybody. So today we will do this segment first, then Dr. Rakib will come with the second module, uh, which will be basically an overview of the 2020 Bangladesh National Building Code. This segment is a, a broad introduction to building codes themselves. The first question is, why building codes? All communities need building codes to protect their citizens from everyday disasters like fires, weather-related events such as floods, and structural collapse that follows deterioration over time of buildings of all kinds. So, so some distress to a structure or, or a structure even collapsing on us does not always have to deal with a, a natural or a man-made disaster. With time, uh, there is decay and, and that itself may cause uh, the failure of a structure. Uh, also, uh, overload, intentional or accidental, uh, can cause the collapse of a structure. Uh, so uh, the role of the building code is supporting building safety uh, and, and this is something I would like to absolutely emphasize. It is emphasized on the uh, next slide. Building codes serve as a means of prevention. This is to be absolutely understood. So they present a choice between an ounce of prevention today <clears throat> and a pound of suffering in the future. This is, this is very, very well said. So, so let, us, let us take uh, earthquake and fire, okay? The, probably the two uh, major hazards that we in Dhaka need to consider in structural design. Earthquakes cannot be prevented. Nobody can prevent an earthquake from happening if it is going to happen. But we know enough to design and build our structures to save lives in earthquakes. We also can design to minimize property damage if we so choose. Same thing with fire. Fire is not exactly a natural disaster. Much of it is man-made. Be that what it may, fires will happen. We, we know that. We, we basically cannot prevent that. Many of them are accidental fires. But we can and absolutely must design buildings such that lives are not lost in fires so that property damage is minimized. And that's where building codes come in. If structures are built according to building codes, the design and the construction are according to building codes, then we should be able to prevent uh, the loss of life. We should be able to minimize uh, damage to property. If we don't do that and something happens, 
the cost is much, much higher. Actually, loss of life, uh, the, the, the cost is not even quantifiable. Uh, so, uh, it, this is an ounce of prevention now rather than being sorry later. That's what building codes are all about. To basically make the point that I tried to make, uh, this is very telling statistics that were compiled by the Disaster Prevention Research Institute at the University of Kobe after the uh, 1995 earthquake. Uh, on the x-axis are, so the, the people at this Disaster Prevention Research Institute surveyed a whole lot of buildings after the earthquakes and, and the statistics are presented in this picture. The uh, on the x-axis are the age of the structures surveyed, built before 65, between 66 and 70, between 71 and 85 and so forth. Okay, the earthquake was in 95, so the most recent is 91 onwards. On the x-axis is, is what percentage of structures surveyed suffered Severe damage or collapse, that's in uh, yellow. Moderate damage, that's the purple. Minor damage, that's the red. Or no damage, which is green. So you see that the oldest structures in the survey built before 1965, a high percentage, 60%, suffered severe damage or collapse. No damage at all was a very small percentage, less than 10. You go to the right, newer structure, 66 to 70, the proportion of significant damage decreased. The percentage of no damage increased. You go to the right, the same trend continues. The newer structures, the percentage of collapse decreases to nothing, or structures built between 81 and 85. And, and by the time you are talking about new structures built after 1991, there is no damage whatsoever. Okay, everything, everything was fine after the earthquake. Why was age this significant? Because in 1971, there was a major change in the Japanese building codes, which basically introduced ductile detailing to reinforced concrete structures. Introduced ductile detailing of reinforced concrete structures. The same thing happened in the United States in 1973. So in Japan, pre-1971 concrete structures are very different from post-71 concrete structures. And that is reflected in the chart. Then in 1981, they introduced, following a major earthquake, another significant change in the Japanese building code, introducing so-called two-level design. The details are not important, but, but ever since the 81, earth, 81 code went into effect, we have had basically no substantive damage to Japanese structures. Their codes are fine. More importantly, the enforcement there is very strict. The, the tradition is such that people do not violate the law and there is, there is law enforcement with teeth in, in, in Japan. So this is the most compelling <laughs> statistics I can show you to tell you how much of a role building codes can play in saving lives in, in, in earthquakes. The much more recent Japanese earthquake, March of 2011, the, this was a huge earthquake, mag, moment magnitude 9.0. Bigger earthquakes maybe can happen, maybe cannot happen. And the city closest to the epicenter of the earthquake is Sendai. 
we went to Sendai, not immediately after the earthquake, but uh, I don't remember, maybe six, seven weeks later. And I want to show you that this was uh, the Sendai Airport, uh, our gateway to that area. Uh, it, I shouldn't say everything looked fine, but, but pretty much everything looked more or less fine. Uh, there, there were little things here and there and then once we got out of the airport waiting for our transportation the, the city looked fine I mean visually you, you wouldn't know that there had been a major earthquake only a few weeks earlier we drove into the city there was literally nothing to be seen magnitude 9.0 I was afraid <laughs> That, that it would be a disaster. There was literally nothing to be seen. I, I'm not saying there was no damage, but somebody had to point out where you would find damage. And the damage was invariably to older buildings. So so some on somebody's tip, we went to Tohoku University, which is very close to the city of Sendai. It, it is part of the city. This is one of the older buildings on the university campus and and you see that things have happened. You, you look at this beam here, you look at this beam here, you look at this beam here, but worse things happened in other parts of the same building. This was a sprawling building that was in the center. There were two wings to the two sides and, and you look at the columns, <clears throat> this one, that one, that one this is an older building the columns does do not have transverse reinforcement that we absolutely always provide these days and 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 as a result you see what you see this is very very common after every earthquake more failure of columns this is sheer compression failure same thing here same thing here so older buildings did suffer damage, newer buildings, basically no damage to be found. The problem in this earthquake <coughs> was not the earthquake itself, but the tsunami that was generated by the earthquake. This, this is the part of the coastline. This is the village of Wanagawa that is within the red box that, that's in the coastal area. Uh, and and this is what you saw uh, the the vivid result of the tsunami totally wiped out entire communities this, this was a very typical scene concrete buildings typically stood but 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 skeletons of buildings I shouldn't say buildings people's possessions were all over uh, children's shoes, photographs, uh, clothes. Uh, it, 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 it's just a tragedy of a magnitude that I cannot even describe. Okay. Now, tsunamis are caused by earthquakes, but, but tsunami, tsunami resistant design is different from earthquake resistant design. And, and, and that is not something I will go into today, but, but, but I do want to emphasize that in the huge 9.0 earthquake in Sendai, close to the epicenter, <clears throat> there was structural damage only to older buildings. Absolutely nothing to be seen by way of damage in newer buildings. Coming from earthquakes to fire, in uh, Chog Bazaar, this is something you are familiar with, the fire. Uh, that that's uh, 2019, very recent. Uh, th this is something I want to emphasize. So this is what happened in summary. A fire started as a result of a road accident between a pickup van and a private car. After the collision, a gas cylinder stored in the private car exploded. The first place the flames hit was a chemical warehouse on the ground floor of a five-story building and the flames then quickly spread through 
four other buildings, including a community center where a wedding party was on. The fire left at least 80 people dead and 50 others injured. So, the bottom line, a chemical warehouse on the ground floor of a five-story building where people lived. Just imagine, this is not allowed by any code. This is not allowed by common sense. This should have been caught if there were any kind of code enforcement. And, and, and the result is, tra is tragedy. Uh, so this is not allowed by the Bangladesh Building Code for sure. There was no enforcement of the code and, and the result is tragic. The more recent uh, fire, Faruk Rupan Tower, Bonani, uh, 28th of March of 2019. You have seen this and a whole lot of other pictures. Uh, this is the, the, the story, very briefly. The tower which was built before 2006 when there was no code did not have a single fire protected staircase. And the main staircase was filled with choking smoke. At just six tenths of a meter wide, this, this was, so there was a staircase inside the building and a steel staircase outside. The steel staircase was six tenths of a meter wide. The inside staircase was 1.2 meters wide. Just, just imagine, it's four feet or so. The building's two exits were too narrow for people inside to leave easily. They were also blocked by obstructions that made the task even harder. Office workers able to reach the top of the building were res rescued by Air Force helicopters. Okay. So this, this was before there was a code, but this would be, this building would be in violation of any code anywhere that I'm familiar with. Okay. People have to have a means of escape and, and that has to be kept open. This is, this is basic common sense almost. According to news reports, the Bangladesh Fire Department had sent two letters in the prior two years highlighting the dangerous lack of safety in the building. So, so the owner was warned. The owner decided not to do anything and the authorities decided not to do anything to the owner. Authorities knew the multi-story block was unsafe. The tower building, in fact, was supposed to be just 18 stories high, but was illegally extended to 23 floors. You, you know, most of you know this story. Okay, so uh, building codes and their enforcement, both are extremely important. Hopefully I've been able to make that point. Why building codes? Building codes are minimum requirements established by society that ensures an acceptable level of safety of building occupants and protection of property. So safety of building occupants and protection of property. The, this minimum requirements is very important. You can always go above the code as we say, but not below the code. Now the above and below is not all that straightforward. You know, when you are supposed to have six bars in a column and you load it up with 12 bars, are you going above the code or are you violating the code? You are actually violating the code because a, a, a heavily reinforced column will behave worse than a lightly reinforced column, particularly in an earthquake situation. So, so when we say you can go above the code, it means you can be more stringent than the code. You cannot be any less stringent. And, and you have to have some technical knowledge to figure out what is more stringent, what is less stringent. But, but the code sets minimum requirements. When codes work sufficiently, nobody notices. When they fail, Society demands stronger, more robust building codes. This, this, this never fails to happen. So this is, this is always true in life. You know, 
you 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 employ somebody to do some job you know as long as the job is being done smoothly efficiently you hardly notice that employee he he, he or she becomes a piece of furniture now when he or she fails to perform then there, there are complaints okay that this is this is this is basically human nature but but we we need to recognize this that that when the codes are working, that does not mean they don't need improvement or they don't need attention. Evolution of building codes. The very first building code that we have record of is from Babylon 2000 before Christ. That's 4100 years ago. Uh, the Code of Hammurabi had many, many things in it, not just buildings. Uh, but this is the building part of the code. In the case of collapse of a defective building, the builder is to be put to death if the owner is if the owner is killed by accident, and the builder's son shall be put to death if the son of the owner loses his life. Okay, so this is eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth kind of justice. But the but the two important but the important thing is that it is life safety. Okay. The, this code is not talking about anything other than life safety. The other thing I find important is that it is the son that counts. There is no mention of daughters. And this is true of the entire code of Hammurabi. The men and women were very, very different back in 2000 BC, at least in that society. Uh, that, that, that's besides the point. Now, so the Code of Hammurabi is, is building safety only. From that, we have evolved a long, long way. Okay, from basic building safety, building not collapsing, killing people, we uh, pretty quickly, I think Dr. Rakib has a little more history in his, in his presentation. We uh, not in Babylonian times, but, but quite a while ago, we, we made fire safety part of our building codes. It, it became the primary part of our building codes many, many times. Then we went into other health and safety considerations in our code. Uh, the, uh, the, the internal environment durability became a consideration in our building codes is our structure going to be good for 50 years is, is something going to happen to it in as few as 10 years uh, uh, if we are building a monument and we want it to stand for the next 200 years are we able to do that 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 kind of consideration maintenance or ease of maintenance we can design to make maintenance easy um, just like uh, there are shirts that do not need any ironing that that can be uh, that can be made okay so so ease of maintenance is has become a consideration in our building codes property protection uh, i mentioned it from the beginning uh, life safety is the primary concern of building codes, but property protection is not overlooked. Uh, and, and I would say that it is receiving increasing attention, if anything. In more recent times, sustainability has become uh, a, a significant consideration in building codes. Uh, our globe is in trouble we we have to do everything to uh, be careful about using natural resources uh, we we i think significant strides have been made uh, concrete buildings now use significant amount of fly ash in the concrete instead of Portland cement. I mean, just to tell you a basic thing that, that we have gone used to doing. There are many, many other considerations. 
and the latest now we are talking more and more about resiliency which is a functional recovery and earthquake passes we need to get the community back on its feet quickly people should start going to schools uh, hospitals need to remain open and and so forth so so we started out with basic life safety codes but then have branched into very very important areas the latest being uh, resiliency and and in the newer codes uh, particularly in the united states i i would say in less than the next decade you will you will see uh, real uh, uh, useful uh, consideration of resiliency, community resiliency. So the what I was saying with the last slide is today the role of building codes is more holistic and they have a greater impact on communities beyond that of safety of the building occupants. It is focused on higher performance, need to preserve skier resources, energy and water efficiency, the sustainability part, allow for, this is, this is another thing that, that we have become more and more aware of. We have to allow for innovation in building design material systems and methods, otherwise we will we'll, we'll remain stagnant and, and that leads to death. So, so it, it is every building code I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with allows solutions that are not specifically provided for in the code. How you implement those other solutions uh, is regulated in different ways, but, but, but this is very, very important to allow innovation in, in building design, in materials, in, in, in structural systems, and in methods of construction. Along, along the same line, more holistic building codes support affordability in housing. That is kind of a societal consideration, but that has crept into the building codes. Support affordability in housing. Now, this you will not find in all building codes around the world, but 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 this has this has. Uh, I would say encroached in, into the building code area. And then community needs for greater resiliency, that is bouncing back after a disaster. Okay. Uh, the, the, this, this, I, I, I uh, cannot emphasize the importance of that. So, uh, you know, an earthquake happens, I have been to many after it has happened, people in tents and, 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 and so forth. How, how, how does normalcy come back? A huge part is when children start going to school. So schools are very important to, to, to get them to function again. Hospitals need to continue to function. This is very, very important. The roads, transportation, that needs to work. So community resiliency, that, that is going to be increasingly our goal. Benefits of building codes. It, it, a building code provides safety and security for our loved ones, protects one, protects one of our greatest financial assets. A, somebody's home is typically a large part of his or her financial assets, provides more resilient communities, helps preserve a country's building stock. I, I think each is, is pretty evident. Building codes are not static documents. A building codes need to be periodically updated in view of society's changing needs and values. I think we all understand that. New technology is another driver. We are finding better and better ways of doing things and those need to be implemented in building codes. New research, a lot of research is going on around the world 
much of many of which, some of which may show us improved way of doing things that we have been doing for, for a long time. That needs to be implemented in codes. Distress in buildings. We, we, we always have distress in some buildings, but when they can be traced directly to a deficiency in our building codes, we need to fix that. Okay. So, so that makes for a, that makes a case for updates of building codes and need to clarify provisions. <laughs> Documents ACI 318, the, the, the code for concrete design and construction. I have been reading that document literally for decades. I, I, I still find like I, I, I would go to a class and I still find that I don't fully understand it. It, it, it seems to be ambiguous. It seems to be not clear enough. And, and that leads to changes. We try to rewrite the language in the next edition to be, to be uh, clearer, better. Okay. So building codes cannot be static documents. This is another important thing. Building codes are not retroactive. A code is updated, new edition comes out. That addition applies to new buildings, not to existing buildings. A new code addition becomes effective on a certain date. From that date on, all applications for construction permits must be for buildings complying with the new code addition. When a new code addition goes into effect, existing buildings need not be evaluated or modified in any way. It, it, so we, we change things in the new edition. That does not automatically mean all existing buildings are now bad, that they have to be updated. No, we, we couldn't live that way. That, that is impractical for, 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 for one thing. Okay? So we, we do things to existing buildings only when there is an addition or an alteration to an existing building. And then whether we we update the old building with alteration or addition to a new code depends upon the extent of the alteration or the addition. If if the addition or the alteration is relatively minor, the alteration or the addition must comply with the new code. If the alteration or the addition is extensive, then the building, including the additional alteration, must comply with the new code. That, that's typically the way a society handles it. Okay, But a new code does not retroactively apply to existing buildings. This I touched upon. A building code provides minimum requirements. A designer may and indeed should go above or beyond the code. That is, follow more stringent requirements. I, I use that language. If in his or her judgment, the added stringency is needed for safety and or performance. So you, you not only can go above the code, you absolutely should go above the code. This is your professional responsibility. If in your judgment, safety, it is going above the code is needed for safety and or performance of your building. So this is the point I was trying to make, okay? More stringent does not mean more. An over-reinforced concrete member performs much worse than an under-reinforced member in an overload situation. The over-reinforced member tends to fail explosively and without warning. This doesn't take an earthquake. Okay? Under gravity load, that is true. The above is particularly important in seismic design. Structural steel and reinforcing steel strength must not be more than specified. That will get you into trouble. <laughs> A structural member must not contain more reinforcement than required by design. Those are extremely important things to remember. OK, 
okay? You, you cannot use higher strength reinforcement when normal strength is specified, not without re-examining your design and, and adjusting things. Okay, going beyond the building code to its implementation and enforcement. This is our project, implementation and enforcement of, of the 2020 edition of the Bangladesh National Building Code. Are those the same, implementation and enforcement? Are they interchangeable words? And I have made the point from the beginning that that is not the case. Implementation is the act of putting something into effect. Okay, new edition has come out, 2020 edition, put it into effect. Start design buildings using the new edition. What is enforcement? Enforcement is making sure that rules are followed, that violations are rectified, that violators are penalized or punished. That's enforcement. Make sure rules are followed, violations are rectified, violators are penalized or punished. Implementation and enforcement are not interchangeable terms. In our reports for component S9, including the latest one, which is enforcement program, we have recommended these implementation steps. The project started in October 2018. At that time, one of our primary goals was to secure final government of Bangladesh approval of, the, of what was then the 2017 edition of the Bangladesh National Building Code. I'm happy to say that has now been accomplished. I do not know if uh, Professor Abedin is listening. Uh, Professor Abedin and our next speaker, Dr. Rakib, played a huge role in, in, in getting that done. I think we should all be grateful to them. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen this. This is uh, Bangladesh Gazette, dated uh, 11th of February 2019. And, and this gazette made the Bangladesh National Building Code 2020 edition somewhere. <laughs> I am pointing here. 2020 edition uh, uh, official. Okay. So the first step is accomplished. I'm very, very happy to say. Next, have Rajuk update their Bidimala to the 2020 edition of BNBC. The current Bidimala dated 2008 is based upon the 2006 edition of BNBC. Okay? We have sent extensive recommendations to Rajuk's Bidimala drafting committee and, and hopefully it is happening, but, but that is a significant step. Launch an awareness campaign. We, we, we have started, we, we, we are stepping things up uh, and, and you will see quite a bit uh, in the next number of months. Develop a commentary to the 2020 edition of the Bangladesh National Building Code. Almost every practitioner we talked to uh, pointed out the importance of this. We, we uh, <laughs> in the US, we cannot even think of using a document like ACI 318 without its commentary. So this is a crying need, but, but this will have to be postponed until phase two of the URP, which the World Bank will hopefully fund. Uh, obviously, that is a major task that we couldn't get into in, in, in this project. Develop support literature. This is beyond commentary let us say design examples and things like that. There, there is a, a, a very significant need for that. Train design professionals, code enforcement personnel, contractors, owners, educators, students, other stakeholders such as financial institutions. Today is the beginning of that. We, we, we have done some of that on visits to Dhaka, but, but that stopped because of COVID 
uh, hopefully it will resume and we will go back to a little of that but but this this training that we are starting today is is uh, <laughs> what we recommended as a major implementation step going from implementation to enforcement i i just want to give you a very very basic idea and and then i will hand over to dr akib uh, <clears throat> so when when a an owner or a developer wants to put up a structure he has a he has a plot of land on which he has permission to build he wants to put up a structure he has to apply to the local jurisdiction in your case rajuk for a construction permit that that's typically what this document is called construction permit okay. in order to issue the construction permit the local jurisdiction in your case rajuk uh, should i should use the word should check the drawings and the calculations to make sure the design and the calculations comply with all requirements of BNBC 2020. Okay. Now, if Rajuk is so satisfied, a permit will be issued. If they are not so satisfied, a permit will be denied. If a permit is denied, the applicant for the permit has the right to appeal. If he or she wins the appeal, he or she gets the permit. If they lose the appeal, then they have to redesign and resubmit. The applicant obviously may choose to skip the appeal. And when a permit is denied, they may decide to redesign and resubmit. So, so one way or the other, until the jurisdiction is satisfied that there is no code violation, a construction permit shall not be issued and without a construction permit if there is any kind of enforcement a a a a, a, a construction of a project cannot start we carried out extensive stakeholder interviews consultations etc as part of our project we found that there is no fire safety plan review for residential buildings up to six stories in height. So these are apartment buildings up to six stories in height where hundreds of people sleep at night. No fire safety review for residential buildings up to six stories in height, not even indirect requirement to meet BNBC fire safety requirements. This was a gaping hole that we, we strongly felt had to be plugged. So when we talk about checking plans and calculations, it is the structural part, the, the fire and life safety part of the code, those have to be complied with also building services mechanical electrical plumbing parts of the code those have to be complied with so construction starts construction proceeds once it is done before the owner can occupy the building he or she has to have a certificate of occupancy occupancy certificate yeah now occupancy certificate will not be issued by a jurisdiction unless they are satisfied that all inspections have been carried out as required by the applicable code so uh, a construction permit is not issued unless design e and drawings are according to code. An occupancy certificate is not issued unless all inspections have been in accordance with code. And any, any departures, deficiencies, deviations found upon inspection have been rectified. Okay. 
If an occupancy certificate is denied, again, the applicant has the right of appeal. If they win the appeal, they get the certificate. If they lose the appeal, they have to reconstruct and, and correct and, 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 and resubmit for an application. So these are the two, two keys that the jurisdiction holds to enforce the code, a construction permit and an occupancy certificate. Both very important documents. We found from our stakeholder consultations that there is no fire safety inspection for residential buildings up to six stories in height. For taller buildings, Bangladesh Fire Safety and Civil Defense has inspections, but shorter buildings, no inspection. And, and that needs to be corrected. Okay. So that's as far as I plan to go. Uh, I plan to take an hour. I'm basically on time. Uh, so uh, uh, the next speaker will, will uh, provide you with an introduction to the uh, Bangladesh National Building Code New Edition. Uh, you, you, all of you obviously know uh, Dr. Rakib Hassan. Uh, one, one of the great privileges of my uh, long professional life has been that uh, I have had the opportunity to work with uh, some of the best in our field. And I can assure you that Dr. Rakib is among the best and, and it's a privilege to have him as, as part of our team. And I'm sure you will enjoy hearing from him. He and I will share uh, much of the structural instruction in, in the upcoming weeks. Okay. With, with that, uh, uh, Professor Rakib, I, I will, uh, it, it will take a minute or so to switch, but, but we will switch, you will hear from him. And at the end of his presentation, we will take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bush. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm Rakib Hassan. I'm Professor of Civil Engineering at Buet. Uh, uh, this is a great privilege for me uh, to get the opportunity to, add, to address such a huge audience of engineers. Um, uh, to present, I'll present just an overview of Bangladesh National Building Code 2020. Uh, actually, I was involved in the updating of BNBC uh, as uh, the coordinator of the uh, team, uh, consulting team. So uh, I got the chance to uh, look through different chapters of the code during the updating process. So today's presentation will be just an overview. This is more, this will be more like a tool uh, of the uh, table of contents of the code. So uh, you may wonder why do you need uh, an overview like this? Uh, what we felt that uh, the engineers, they're more or less familiar with the code, but uh, structural engineers only consult with the structural engineering chapters, electrical engineers consult the electrical engineering chapters like that. But I think it is always good to have an uh, overall understanding of the code so that when people talk about different topics, you can uh, have, a, have an understanding uh, a concept that from which part uh, the discussion is on. So uh, that's why we'll uh, present the overview at the very beginning, uh, at the first day of this uh, uh, entire training program. Um, if, uh, Dr. Koch has already mentioned about uh, this new uh, version of the code. It was, uh, it was officially uh, gazetted in February 11, 2021, but, but as you can see that uh, in part one, chapter one, first title and commencement, it is supposed to be called BNBC 2020. So that's why we'll call it BNBC 2020. Uh, this is a huge quote. Uh, before going to the structure of the code, um, 
let's have a look at the history of our building code, uh, BNBC. Actually, the, uh, I think uh, most of you know that BNBC was first drafted in 1993, uh, but it was not an official document. Uh, it was a draft version. Uh, anyone could, if anyone could opt, could follow the BNBC, uh, but it was not compulsory. But in 2006, it was made compulsory through uh, an SRO, statutory regulatory order. So it became a regulation. At the same year, uh, actually simultaneously, our uh, Building Construction Act, BC Act, which was enacted in 1952, was amended to uh, have reg uh, to have uh, BNBC as a regulation in the legal framework. So, uh, being, uh, Building Construction Act was amended, and the new clause, probably 18A was included which uh, mentioned about the building code. So in 2006 uh, it became official document, a gazette, so it became compulsory for every all engineers to follow BNBC. It became a law. During the same time uh, there was a realization that this, since BNBC was actually drafted in 1993 it actually became very quite old, it needs updating. So HBRI, actually uh, even in the first place in 1993, it was a project of HBRI, Housing and Building Research Institute. In 2009, again, HBRI uh, took up another project for updating the code. So uh, the updating process was initiated and it took a very long time, as you can see, to, uh, to finish the updating process and uh, make it available as a gazette. So it became gazette only a couple of months back in this year. So that's the history. Uh, one thing I should mention is that although we are calling it BNBC 2020 and it was gazetted in 2021, the main technical contents of this code were actually written in uh, around 2010. So all the international standards that are mentioned in this code in the updated version uh, are mostly uh, before the year 2010. So we should be aware of that. So uh, um, before going to the contents, what we have in the code, First, we need to understand what the code is actually for. Uh, Dr. Kosh has already mentioned that uh, the code, building code, is supposed to provide the minimum requirements for safety. So uh, many of us have a misconception that uh, if we follow the code and build a building, construct a building, the building is a very high standard. Yes, probably high standard, but that is the minimum standard that we must follow. Uh, you can make it better if you understand how you can make it better. You have to have sound technical knowledge to make a building better than the code suggests it to be. But you, you, there is no limitation, there is no restriction, you can make it better. And the code is the minimum standard, so you must follow it. It is not an option. There is another misconception many times I heard that many people saying that why don't you write the code in Bangla so that everyone can understand. You have to understand that the code is not meant for general public to read. It is actually only for the professionals who will be involved in design, construction, maintenance, supervision, in professional uh, activities related to a building. So uh, there are many thousands of uh, equations, diagrams, which is impossible for a general public who doesn't have any uh, uh, background in technical knowledge. It is For him or her, it is impossible to follow the code. 
so the code is written only for the professionals but there are some clauses which are uh, relevant for public for general public particularly building owners so mention some of those clauses but those are very specific clauses uh, we can uh, we can make those only those clauses probably in bangla and circulate but that's a different issue the code is mainly for the professionals uh, then uh, what is the definition of building we are um, we we are discussing building code but what is a building according to the code any permanent or semi permanent structure which is constructed or erected for human habitation or for any other purpose and includes but not limited to the foundation plinth walls floors, roofs, stairs, chimneys, fixed platform, veranda, balcony, cornice, projection, extensions, annexes, etc. So actually everything. So what is important here to me is the foundation part. Uh, building, if we can make a temporary structure without a foundation and that will not make it a building. For example, uh, I quite often uh, give this example in our export fair those who are familiar with the export fair I hope most of you are uh, in our export fair there we usually have a lot of stalls uh, where the uh, business people show their products in those stalls so some of the stalls are two-story three-story but do they make those stalls uh, buildings no, because those stalls do not have foundation. So this is important. A building, uh, is, a building has to have a foundation, which make it permanent or semi-permanent structure. And everything related to building comes within the fold of the definition of a building. We'll also include the sanitary, plumbing, electrical, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, appurtenances, and all other building service installations which are constructed or erected as an integral part of a building. So, yeah, everything related to a building, all the fixtures, appurtenances, everything. So that's it. That's the definition of building. Now we come to the structure of BNBC uh, with very big uh, fonts. I have written here volume 1, volume 2, volume 3. Uh, why? But unfortunately, now the uh, version you you can access uh, the gazetted version that is a five thousand exactly five thousand forty two page document. Uh, but in this gazetted version, I didn't find mention of volumes, volume one, two, three. But uh, in the uh, initially we prepared a book version of this. Uh, updated building code. In the book version, we have suggested three volumes of the uh, which will make the whole code, the entire code. Uh, hopefully, the book version will be published very soon. Um, uh, I had a talk with HBRI even this week. So from next week, we'll be working on publication of the book version, which HBI will publish separately for convenience of the engineers so that it is convenient for the engineers to consult the uh, BNBC. In the gazetted form, you'll see that there is no table of content. Uh, there, there is no, uh, what do you call it, header, footer. So it is very difficult to actually follow which is, who, which is the part or which chapter you were reading so uh, there will be a book version hopefully in the book version there will be three volumes as in the case of bnbc 2006 in bnbc to 2020 also there will there are 10 parts the entire code is divided in 10 parts uh, because this is actually mentioned in the bc act building construction act that what should be 
there in the building code. It is exactly these 10 um, titles are written in the act. So that's why uh, it is uh, it is structured like this. So what are the parts? Part 1 is related to scope and definition. Uh, basically what I have uh, just said to you that is what is a building and uh, what is the scope of BNBC so more elaborately obviously and other very general definitions are provided in this part this is a very small, small part then actual technical stuff uh, oh, sorry and then part two is related to administration and enforcement what this project of URP urban resilience project S9 component is all about enforcing the billing code so part two is related to administration and enforcement. The main technical stuff starts from part three. Part three is general building requirements, control and regulation. This is the part the architects need to follow. This is the architectural part. And some chapters of this part are, uh, are also related to fire safety. So basically, this is the part which act, uh, the architects have to follow. Part four is related is entirely about fire protection, more more uh, related to uh, fire detection and fire fighting. That is for part four. Part five is related to building materials, all types of building materials, structural and non-structural. Uh, the standards that are follow that we have to follow. Uh, for the materials are mentioned in this part. These five parts constitute volume one. Uh, this is probably the thinnest volume of the code. Part six is all about structural design. Everything about structural design is in one part, that is part six, and this part six alone constitutes volume 2 and we often call it the heart of the code this is the most voluminous volume of the code mm, uh, probably almost half of the code uh, total number of pages uh, will be there in part 6 part 7 uh, that is related to construction practices and safety I found that many engineers do not, uh, they, there is a misconception that uh, the building code is only for the designers. The designers will have to follow building code for design. But this is very important, part seven, seven, which is about construction practices and safety. So the engineers who are involved in construction, they should be aware that there is a part in the code that they need to read. Part 8 is related to building services. This is also a very important part. Everything related to electrical um, services, mechanical services like heating, ventilation, air conditioning, lifts, um, or acoustics, that is uh, sound related things, um, or plumbing, water supply, drainage, gas supply these are all the building services are included in part eight part nine is a very small part this is related to addition alteration to and change of use of existing buildings uh, this is the only part that talks about existing buildings there, there is some mention probably in part six two very uh, regarding load test or something like that but mostly the entire code is for new construction, the uh, for new buildings to be constructed. Uh, part nine is for existing building. If we want to make any change in the existing building, what should be the uh, administrative procedures that we, we should follow? It is more related to that part nine. There is some interesting uh, updating in this part. We may. We may discuss about that a little. 
part 10 is related to sine this is the smallest part uh, part 10 is related to signs and how to display all types of signs like exit sign or uh, entry sign or uh, the signs that you use for construction. This is all about related uh, to signs and displays. This is a small part and from part 7 to part 10, part 10 that is included in volume 3. So there will be three volumes. Now you may ask why three volumes? The previous code was in only one volume and that was convenient. Yes, but the volume, uh, if you remember the volume of the previous version, um, that is quite heavy, but still that was manageable. Uh, you could take it uh, from one place to uh, one table to another but that is going to be more than two times in volume this new code so it will be really difficult to manage as a single volume that's why it will be uh, in the book format it will be published in three volumes so I spent a lot of time on that okay now as I said I will go through the table of contents of all these parts. I won't go into the technical details, but only for part two administration and enforcement, I will try to touch upon some important things uh, because these uh, matters are important for you to know and this will not be covered in any other uh, sessions of this training program. That's why I'll touch upon them a little bit. Part two is uh, administration and enforcement. This part has got uh, three chapters. The first chapter is purpose and if applicability. Uh, second chapter is on establishment of authority, etc. Uh, you may wonder why the title of this chapter is like this. Actually, the proposed title was different, but the Ministry of Law, they uh, made the chapter, uh, the title like this. I don't know, there must have some reasons for that, but these two chapters, chapter one and chapter two, even in the book format, will be um, completely uh, in uh, uh, like a legal document. Uh, each of the clauses uh, will, be, uh, will be numbered, even in the book format, because Ministry of Law thought that these two are like, law. So, and all other chapters uh, in the book format will be uh, will be formatted consistently, but these two chapters uh, will be numbered like uh, each clause will be numbered. Now, I want to talk about the second chapter, establishment of authority, etc. As you all know, and Dr. Ghosh has already uh, mentioned that the main problem with our code was enforcement. There was the code, but there was no enforcement whatsoever. So why was that so? Why wasn't there any enforcement? Because, most probably because there, there was no enforcing authority uh, who had the authority to enforce the code. Uh, if you see the uh, previous version of the code, there was mention of the authority, but that mention was quite vague. There's not a clear cut mention who the actual authority was. But this time, uh, and the idea last time was more, more uh, decentralized. So that was a problem. Uh, which jurisdiction will be under which authority that was not clear, at least in the code that was not clear. This time to overcome that problem, it is proposed in the code that there, ha there will be, it is being proposed, a Bangladesh Building Regulatory Authority, BBRA, an authority uh, the proposed responsibilities of authority of this authority will be quite broad but most important responsibility of this authority is enforcement of the building code so we may we can hope that in near future there will be an authority 
will take this responsibility on their shoulder. Uh, but don't take this, uh, uh, this granted that just because the code has been gazetted doesn't mean that the authority uh, will be established automatically. There has to be a new act law for establishment of the authority. So we'll have to be, wait a bit longer to, uh, to have this authority in, in reality. Uh, this the idea is that the authority will not be a very have very um, big organization uh, the authority will consist of five members only five members uh, the code mentions what should be the qualifications of the members but the actual activities of these uh, these uh, authority will be conducted through some other organizations will see that. The most important role will be played by building officials. Now who are the building officials? Uh, actually presently the um, Rajuk officers whom we know as authorized officers, they play the role of building officials. They are synonymous. Building official as mentioned in the building code is synonymous to uh, authorized officer as mentioned in the Imarut Nirman Vidhimala. So take them as synonyms. So uh, the authority shall designate specific geographical jurisdiction as the office of the building official. So you can then uh, question that then what will happen to the authorized officers of Raju? Will they go under um, this BBRA? We'll answer that soon. The billing official shall exercise through a building construction committee, BC committee, as you know, Rajuk has BC committees and the other, the other uh, KDA, RDA and CDA, they all have BC committees. So that concept is there. The BC committee will be there. The authority may constitute a board of appeal to hear and decide appeals of orders, decisions, determinations made by the building officials. So uh, uh, the code is talking about a board of appeal, uh, but in Imarut Nirman Bithimala there is similar kind of board, but the name is a bit different, but that board can actually play the same role. So things are more or less same, but uh, they will be conducted under this authority. How? So the authority will not act alone. The authority will actually take help of Rajuk, CDA, RDA, KDA, and some other organizations. So the authorities officers of Rajuk will play the same role as they're doing right now. Uh, but the, all the policies, all the protocols, uh, all the procedures, these will be directed from the authority. So uh, the Rajuk authorized officers will be under Rajuk. They will be, uh, they will get their salary from Rajuk, but they will follow the policies, procedures, protocols that will be prescribed by the authority. So this is the format that is being proposed here. So similarly for other uh, development authorities, and then what about uh, other areas which are not under uh, 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 development authority, like city corporations? So for those areas, see under the, the um, there will be some authorized officers uh, under city corporation. There will be some authorized officers under municipality corporation. And what about suburban areas and rural areas? Buildings are being constructed in those areas too, so shouldn't be uh, come shouldn't they come under some uh, regulations? They should, and uh, it is being proposed that the executive engineer of a certain jurisdiction or executive engineer of public works department will have the uh, authority of a building official. Uh, 
just like the authors officers of Rajuk. So this is the concept that is being proposed in this building code. Hopefully, if the authority is established, BBRA established, um, then we may we may see better enforcement of the building code all over the country. Now, uh, this is not something new. The, this was there in the Marat Neman Bidhimala. Uh, it is uh, now uh, also part of the building code that the, there will be four types of permits, uh, a land use certificate, large and specialized project permit, building permit, and occupancy certificate. And uh, after an application is uh, submitted for a particular permit, how many days, uh, within how many days, the authority should um, dispose the application is given here. Uh, this is um, obligation on the part of the authority and what would be the validity of that permit and uh, that is also given here. Now another thing is very important the, the a building is categorized in many different ways in the code. Uh, for structural purposes we classify building in one way for architectural purpose we building classify in another way for fire protection, fire safety purpose, we classify building in yet in another way. There are many classifications, um, but for approval purpose, building plan approval, inspection, for these purposes, administrative purposes, we categorize building in four categories. Up to two-story height, up to five-story height, up to ten-story, and beyond that. There is also uh, space limitation. If a uh, structure is within, uh, say, single story structure, but, but very large, more, the area is floor area is more than 250 meters square. In that case, that will be classified as category two instead of building category one. So two things, one is height and another is area. Based on these two criteria, we will categorize a building. Why do you need this category? Because uh, we are assigning required qualification for a professional who can design a specific uh, design a building of a specific category or inspect a building of a specific category, supervise a building of a specific category, or be involved in construction of a building of a specific category. So. Uh, what qualification does a professional need will depend uh, on which type of building is going to be uh, involved with. This is a very small version of a big table. If you are interested, you can consult the table. I, I don't remember the number, but that is in part two, chapter three of BNBC. There is a table where uh, what should be the qualification of a professional is written. For example, for say structural design, for building category one that is two-storied, uh, one doesn't need to have uh, actually one doesn't need to have a civil engineering degree. Not applicable. I mean, one must have a civil engineering degree. Sorry. Uh, one doesn't need to have um, specific years of experience. For category two type building, one has to have at least two years of experience, a relevant experience. So how can he have an experience? He can work as an apprentice with some other senior engineer and can have experience. So after having two years of experience, he can actually sign a structural design two story bill of two story building. Then for category three, he has to have a minimum of four years of experience. For category four building, he has to have a minimum, he or she has to have a, an experience of at least eight years and so on. For other purposes, the qualifications are given here. So this is an important table. Imarat Nirman Bidhimala has this kind of, had this kind of table also, but this is an updated one.
hopefully in the updated Imarat Nirman Vidhimala similar to the table will be there. Now uh, for some some specific government installations we, uh, we don't need any permit. Uh, we can construct very important government installations without applying for a permit. So that's a different story. I'll just skip that. I'm taking too much time. Uh, okay, this is uh, this is one thing I thought uh, this is important for all of us to know, including uh, non-technical people. What are the responsibilities of the owner? This is there in the code. The first line is, see, the owner shall be responsible for carrying out the work in conformity of this code. The code uh, mentions that the, this responsibility, that the building, a building will be constructed according to the code. The responsibility is primarily with the owner. But as you can understand that the owner is not a technical person, he doesn't understand the code. But what he can do, he can, uh, he can make the professionals, he can plead to the professionals that please make the building according to the code. And he should not obstruct the professionals for uh, while they follow the code, which is uh, uh, which is quite often, which quite often happens so that the owners, they, to, re to reduce the cost of construction, sometimes they ask the professionals that just uh, to uh, violate the code provisions. And design, execution and supervision work shall be carried out by authorized registered professionals as I have already shown in the table that the, uh, the owner should employ uh, designer, uh, construction supervisor with required number of years of uh, experience. The owner shall allow the billing officials to enter. This is uh, also very important. We, quite often we, heard, uh, we hear from uh, uh, Rajuk officials that they couldn't enter um, some buildings because they were obstructed by the owner, but that is actually an offense. The owner shall obtain permit as may be applicable. All the required permits must be availed by the owner. Uh, the owner must avail them. The owner shall inform the billing official about attainment of construction work of different stages. Uh, it is more uh, uh, more elaborate provisions are there in the Imarat Nirman Bidhimala, but also in the building code, uh, like uh, construction completion certificate, occupancy certificate at different stages one has to uh, apply for per permit. Uh, the owner shall take proper safety measures. So this is also uh, a responsibility of the owner um, that uh, the laborers who are working uh, in the building project, they should work in safe uh, environment and the people surrounding the construction site should also be safe, things like that. The owner shall notify the building official the completion of the work. The owner shall preserve at the site a copy of all permits. That is important. All permits should be preserved at the site so that whenever uh, law enforcing people, uh, particularly BNBC enforcing people, uh, uh, ask for the permits, the owners can uh, show them. Where uh, the livelihoods exceed 2.4 kilonewton per meter square, design livelihoods shall be conspicuously posted. So this is more relevant for industrial structures where there are heavy livelihoods. Uh, the allowable load should be uh, posted on the wall. So that is a, a responsibility of the owner. Okay, so uh, another interesting topic is what what is there in the code about unsafe buildings? So it is not only in the code, it is also uh, there are some clauses also in the BC Act regarding unsafe buildings. 
So in the code, it is mentioned that all buildings to constitute danger to public safety or property shall be declared unsafe by the building official. So building official has the authority to declare any building unsafe. In case the owner fails, neglects, or refuses to carry out the repair or improvement of an unsafe building, the building official shall cause the danger to be removed. So uh, he can uh, rectify the problem either by de demolition or repair the cost of which shall be borne by the owner so after uh, repairing or demolishing the unsafe part the cost will be reimbursed by the owner if the building official considers that an unsafe building constitute imminent danger the building official shall at once cause such building to be rendered safe or removed so the billing official has the authority to remove an entire building. So, uh, but uh, be careful. Uh, <laughs> these sentences I have uh, taken from the code, but these are not the complete sentences. Probably uh, I made the sentence a bit short for the presentation. So please don't take the clauses uh, as being presented here. Please consult uh, the code for the exact wordings of these clauses. The billing official may also get the adjacent structures vacated and protect the public by an appropriate fence. So uh, these were these are some provisions regarding unsafe buildings. So. Um, the other authority, uh, um, other powers that a billing official uh, enjoys um, is, uh, for example, the architectural and environmental control. This is in addition to all the provisions of the billing codes. The authority can impose some other conditions and restrictions to enforce architectural and environmental control. So, for example, uh, for major public building complexes or buildings in the vicinity of monuments and major sculptures, for example, um, all the, the government may desire, uh, the authority may desire that all the buildings nearby, say, suppose our Shongshud Bhavan, Parliament building, all other buildings should follow a similar pattern of architecture. That's an additional control the authority may impose. So that right is given in the court to the authority, to the government, uh, in these special cases, like buildings near architecturally valuable structures, buildings near historic buildings, buildings near structures that represent the spatial characteristics of an area, building that represents spatial characteristics, any development that may have effect on the environment, the authority shall appoint a standing committee comprising noted experts. So two, the government actually cannot just arbitrarily impose restrictions and controls. Uh, the code requires the authority to have a standing committee of experts who will guide this type of control. So that were some topics from part two. Part two itself is quite big. There are a lot of other things. Uh, just to, uh, what to say, whet your interest. I have shown some of the topics from part two. Now the rest is uh, more or less the table of content of the code. I'll just show what are the topics that are uh, in the code. So part three is general building requirements, control and regulation. This is basically architectural uh, provisions of the code. So there in part three, there are four chapters, general building requirements, classifications of buildings based on occupancy, classification of building construction type based on fire resistance, and chapter four is related to energy efficiency and sustainability. Now, uh, so 
the first two chapters were there also in the previous version of the code. Chapter 4 is completely a new addition to this code. So as uh, Dr. Koch was uh, showing the evolution of building codes from basic structural safety to fire safety, gradually maintenance, ease of maintenance, things like that, and uh, finally sustainability and presently resiliency. So the sustainability, as he was, uh, as he mentioned, that part was uh, that topic is addressed exactly here in this chapter, chapter four of part three of BNBC twenty twenty. So, uh, so I won't go in details of the technical stuff of these chapters, but some important things I'll show. For example, occupy as I say. We classify buildings in many different ways in the code. One is architectural classification, and is fire say, fire related classification, and there is structural related classification, and there is administrative related classification. So you have to understand the concept when we talk about classification of buildings. So this is the architectural classification based on occupancy. So there, these number from A to L. Uh, um, classes of buildings. A is residential, but there are subclasses. There are A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, and things like that. For example, A1 is single uh, family dwelling, A2 is apartment type building, and so on. A3 is dormitory, and so on, or ho dormitory, hotel. So there are different types of res residential buildings, as you can imagine. So. A is residential, but there are subclasses. Sub -classes. B is educational facilities, starting from primary schools, secondary schools, uh, colleges, universities, training centers, um, um, all types of educational facilities. C is institution for care. So although the name suggests uh, quite uh, <laughs> something, some places where is, people are quite caring, but prison or jail is in this class. Actually, this is institution means where people will be under some restrictions. Okay, and so this institution for care is class uh, C. D is healthcare facilities starting from normal clinics uh, uh, to very big hospitals. Everything will be in class D. E, businesses, offices. Offices are in class E. F is mercantile, all kinds of shops and markets, malls. Uh, they are in class F. G is industrial buildings, all types of industries, garment factory industries, uh, steel re-rolling mills, cement factories, all types of industry buildings. H is storage buildings. Uh, storage buildings uh, like silos or green storage or uh, uh, like uh, uh, where you need refrigeration um, to store fresh things, all types of storage, warehouses. Uh, I is assembly building where many people gather together like theater, stadium, Things where, or mosques or uh, temples where many people gather. J is hazardous building. Uh, these buildings, are, uh, if these buildings collapse or are damaged, then the safety of surrounding people may be in danger. So that type of buildings are called hazardous building. K garage. Garage, uh, there will be two types of garages, like parking buildings, uh, buildings uh, which will be used entirely for parking, parking garages, and um, auto shops, like where uh, parts, uh, cars are fixed, uh, sh uh, automobile workshops. Those are also classified as garages in this world. Utility buildings, like uh, uh, the buildings where you uh, 
uh, house the generator or the substation, electrical generator, electrical substation, or services are provided from uh, these types of buildings. Uh, like uh, in industries, you can have the effluent treatment plant in one building that will be a utility building, a utility building. And there will be miscellaneous, that is any combination of this mix type of these buildings, these occupancy types. So other architectural issues that are covered, uh, uh, so you can have a look, it will take a lot of time if I just even uh, read these, them, so I'll just skip uh, because I'm running out of time. Now, very important chapter, energy chapter four of part three, energy efficiency and sustainability. Uh, you may you, uh, you may wonder what is this energy efficiency and sustainability? If you are a structural engineer, if you are an environmental engineer, you, you may be very familiar with these terms. Sustainability refers to the concept that. Um, uh, the resources that is there on earth, uh, those are not re depleted or uh, we just don't uh, consume everything and leave the earth without resources for our next generation. So that is basically what sustainability is all about, That uh, the so that the earth retains its resourcefulness. So one particular problem the whole global community is facing is global warming and climate change. Because of global warming and climate change, uh, the, the sustainability is in danger. The reason for global warming and uh, climate change is basically we are using uh, things like uh, fossil fuel, we are burning petrols, we are burning uh, these uh, uh, petroleums and other things. So that gives a lot of carbon dioxide in air, in the atmosphere, which is causing the global warming. Now, uh, for everything, like for in a building, whenever we switch on, uh, any electrical appliance like fan, air conditioning, uh, light, we are using electricity. But where this electricity is coming from? This electricity is coming from the generators. And the generators are using fossil fuels in one way or another. They are using either gas, uh, LNG, or um, uh, diesel. So we are actually, whenever we are using energy, we are actually burning fossil fuel, which is going to the atmosphere and causing the global warming and this climate change. So to reduce this problem, we have to be efficient in using in consuming energy. So so that we use less amount of electricity, less amount of water, so that we can preserve the energy. So for that, uh, there is another term that is quite often used is green building, that is energy efficient building. So green building, the concept of green building is here in this chapter, chapter four. So the scope is building concepts having a positive environmental impact and encourage sustainable construction practices, allowing efficient and efficiency and conservation of energy, water and building materials, and to promote resource efficiency. So that is the whole purpose of this chapter. Now, the four ways uh, are there. One is site sustainability, like uh, site sustainability is related to uh, like maximum ground coverage. What amount of ground we should cover with concrete and what amount of ground should be left green so that rainfall can percolate through the ground. That type of uh, provisions are there in the site sustainability part. Building envelope, which, what should be the uh, 
shape of a building? Should it be a square one or a rectangular one or a circular one? And which direction should it face? Things like that. Based on these, actually, the amount of uh, air conditioning or amount of heating we need that depends on this. So building envelope is involved is important to minimize the energy requirement. Energy efficient building systems like electrical systems, mechanical systems. How uh, there are different energy efficient systems. Uh, uh, like like um, there are sensors which can detect uh, the movement of people so if they there are people then suppose uh, the light can be uh, switched on if there is no people that can be automatically switched off it's just an example or a day daylight sensing sensor when there is already daylight there is no point of uh, having artificial light on so using that kind of sensors so that energy efficient building systems uh, provisions related to that are in this chapter internal water management so water uh, the amount of water we use actually we don't we don't need that much uh, of water uh, we sometimes waste water so how to minimize that and how we can recycle use water for different purposes to uh, reduce the amount of water uh, we are using. So uh, these, uh, these things are discussed in this chapter. This is a new addition. Fire protection. This is very important chapter. A lot of things are there. Uh, there are five chapters this time. General provisions, precautionary requirements, means of egress, equipment and inbuilt facility standards, specific requirements for fire detection and extinguishing system. A lot of things. And they will be uh, presented to you to, by Professor Hilali in this training program. So I will go into the detail, but one thing I want to touch, I, I couldn't uh, restrict myself. <laughs> I will touch upon only one thing, although I'm not qualified for that the concept of means of egress oh no not only one thing this is this is um, uh, classification based classification types of construction based on you know, fire rating i won't go into the detail of that but this one i want to uh, i can't resist my temptation to address this uh, means of egress i think this should be a general knowledge uh, what is a means of egress? We know about fire escape. We understand usually by fire escape that the additional stair or adi right additional stair by which we can uh, exit a building. But actually, a means of egress should have some more uh, components with it. A means of egress is an evacuation system with the provisions of re-entry for rescuers and firefighters so means of evidence doesn't only about exit firefighters and rescuers should be able to re-entry into the building where a continuous and unobstructed way of exit travel shall be provided from any point within a building to a designated area of refuge uh, so this part we understand that there should be an unobstructed way to the fire escape but the fire escape cannot end like in the basement uh, the fire escape must exit to a designated area of refuge where people can go out of the building and be safe for uh, allowable delayed evacuation so that from there they can be evacuated and ended up with the exit termination by reaching a street abutting building or plot or a safe area which is open to air and designated assemblies for evacuees etc so uh, i found it quite interesting that's why i mentioned although i'm not qualified to discuss anything about fire the next part is related to building materials uh, so in this part there are two chapters one is very short, 
chapter on scope and definitions. Uh, there are some definitions in that chapter. Chapter two is the main thing. Uh, building matters. All types of structural and non-structural materials are mentioned there. Not only mentioned, the standards that have to be met, satisfied for a particular purpose. Like if there's a construction material, so what standards should they uh, should that material uh, satisfy? Like for many materials, we have BDS. Bangladesh standards like cement, like steel, river, we have BDS standards, although adopted from either ISO or uh, EN, but we do have BDS standards. But for many other materials, uh, different international standards are mentioned in this part, but we just have to be careful that proper standards are uh, met. Uh, the materials we use that should satisfy those standards. That's it. So this is important. Another thing I should mention, that doesn't restrict us from using any new material that is not mentioned in the quote. Some people have a misconception that, uh, oh, this material is not mentioned in this quote, so we cannot use as building material. No. If a material is not mentioned in the quote, but still we can use that material if it satisfies the desired performance level. For that purpose, I think Dr. Ghosh uh, can uh, explain these things a lot better than I can. Uh, for that purpose, in the United States, the ICC plays a very big role in accreditating probably, the I don't know the correct term, uh, like uh, to to permit the use of a specific, uh, of a new material if it shows the desired performance. Okay, that was, uh, those five chapters constitute volume one. Volume two is part six, which is structural design. So we'll have a lot of sessions on structural design, on specific topics, but in this uh, part, part six, there are 13 chapters. In the previous version of the code, there were 11 chapters. So there are two new chapters. What are the chapters? The chapters, the chapter one is definitions and general requirements. This is an important chapter. Uh, uh, it, it has got a lot of provisions related to loads and analysis and design, some general requirements. For example, for example, the classification of structures the category importance categories, risk categories, or uh, the definitions of regular and irregular buildings. These things are there in this chapter, chapter one. Chapter two is uh, what we are, uh, this chapter is the most uh, familiar chapter to, uh, to structural engineers, I think. Uh, loads on buildings and stru structures. We are familiar with this chapter. Uh, so wind load, earthquake load, dead load, live load, wind load, earthquake load, and other loads like flood load, uh, surge load, and other loads are discussed here. Construction loads, temperature, other types of loads. Chapter 3 is soils and foundations. So uh, this is related to geotechnical investigation, soil classification, uh, bearing capacity, different types of foundations and their design uh, provisions are uh, mentioned in this chapter. So this is particularly for geotechnical engineers. Chapter 4 is the new chapter. It's bamboo. You may be surprised, but actually this is, this is um, from Indian building code. So this is this, this chapter is in Indian Building Code. We just followed that that chapter, bamboo. Oh, we found it interesting. We thought that uh, we shouldn't restrict our uh, ourselves to traditional like uh, concrete and steel only. We can use bamboo to build small structures, rural structures. Chapter five: concrete materials. So. Uh, Part five is related to, to all type of construction and non-structural materials. But concrete is again 
particularly uh, discussed in this chapter within uh, in structural design part because of its importance uh, so concrete many things related to concrete are discussed in chapter 5 chapter 6 is strength design of reinforced concrete structures so in uh, previous version of the code there were two design methodologies for concrete structures one was working design working stress WSD uh, working stress design method and there was the strength design method USD ultimate strength this time the uh, there is only strength design method in the main chapters working stress design method is mentioned in the appendix so that is not entirely uh, out of the code but uh, that is not uh, prescribed so basically strength design method is the only um, prescribed method in this code chapter 7 for concrete structures chapter 7 masonry structures so uh, there will be a separate session in this uh, training program on masonry structures so we can uh, discuss on that in that session chapter 8 detailing of reinforced concrete structures so uh, concrete again but this is detailing and this is very very important the even the design part chapter 6 uh, even the load part is related to this chapter 8 Chap there is a connection between chapter 2 and chapter 8 Dr. Ghosh will uh, discuss about these things elaborately in his presentations in the coming weeks chapter 9 is related to uh, pre-stress concrete structures chapter 10 steel structures uh, this has become a very very big chapter compared to the previous version many things are there chapter 11 is timber structures it was also there in the previous version chapter 12 ferro cement structures it was also there in the previous version chapter 13 is new steel concrete composite structural members so composite construction uh, where uh, for example a column may have uh, steel pipe outside and inside there may be concrete fill so which we call CFT concrete fill tube or there may be a column with uh, steel uh, eye section inside and outside there may be concrete encasement so uh, there may be uh, different uh, there are different types of composite structures so this is a new chapter uh, on that topic so and hopefully in future this will be quite popular construction type in Bangladesh volume 3 so the rest of the code is volume 3 which has got four more chapters but parts part 7 8 9 and 10 part 7 is related to construction practices and safety there is a separate session on construction practices we'll discuss uh, on that but just let's see the chapters that are there what are the chapters construction responsibilities and practices uh, uh, this is related to how to plan uh, construction uh, what should be there in the construction site so things like that uh, safety of uh, the surrounding people storage stacking and handling practices chapter 2 all types of uh, materials construction materials are discussed here how to store them how to uh, handle them properly chapter 3 is related to safety during construction so uh, different uh, types of construction works like uh, pile driving what safety uh, precautions we should uh, take while pile driving while say uh, excavating uh, while um, installing uh, a steel uh, structure using a crane things like that that is uh, covered in chapter 3 chapter 4 is related to demolition work it was there also in the previous version but um, 
Unfortunately, many engineers are not aware that there is a chapter on demolition in the core. Uh, we've, we found that, as you know, uh, in 2000, which year, six probably, uh, ranks building collapsed during demolition. Uh, at that time, that there were so flagrant violations <laughs> of provisions of this chapter. Uh, while in that demolition work. Chapter 5, maintenance, management, repairs, retrofitting and strengthening of buildings. So, uh, not many technical things are there, uh, but some important things like uh, what load should be considered in assessment, things like that are there in Chapter 5. Okay. Uh, part 8, building services. So, a lot of things are there. Electrical and electronic engineering services, all types of electrical fittings, fixtures, uh, and uh, the standards that we should follow for that, that is mentioned in Chapter 1. Chapter 2 is related to what we call HVAC, air conditioning, heating, and ventilation. Chapter 3 is on building account, acoustics that is related to sound. That is, uh, there may be two types of aspect like uh, if we want some place to be quiet, so we can make it like soundproof, uh, like in a studio, like in a theater, a cinema hall. If you cannot, if the walls uh, do not absorb the sound, then if the there there is reverberation echo, you can't hear the sound properly. So that is acoustics is about. Uh, for example, in a classroom, if the lecture of the uh, instructor, you cannot hear the lecture properly. So that is a pro acoustic problem. So building acoustics is important for many structures. Chapter 4, lifts, escalators, and moving walks. So uh, these are the small transportation devices within a building. Uh, chapter 5, water supply. Uh, this is very important, uh, that uh, plumbing. This is all about plumbing. This chapter 5 and chapter 6, water supply and sanitary drainage. Now, chapter 7 is a new chapter, rain water management. Uh, usually we call it rainwater harvesting. Here not only harvesting, the whole management, uh, all the technical requirements are given in this chapter. How to uh, catch rainwater on the roofs, how to, what should be the, uh, uh, how the plumbing should be, and where to store the rainwater, uh, how to store, how to get rid of the impurities, things like that. Uh, how can we use that with small treatments? Uh, things, uh, these things are described in Chapter 7. Uh, okay. Chapter 8 is fuel and gas supply. So it was there in the previous code too. The, the, uh, there are some new provisions in this code on Chapter a, on gas supply. So uh, I think I should should not go into the details of all these services. I'll just skip. You can have a look that uh, there are new things even in the electrical billing services like CCTV and access control system. It was not there in the previous code. This is something new, things like that. So HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. So things like energy conservation is a new uh, topic in this um, chapter. Acoustics is completely uh, written uh, from a new perspective. So this is quite different from the previous version. Uh, lifts, escala lifts and escalators. So again, you can see energy conservation is there. Water supply. So it is quite detailed and many new diagrams have been included in this chapter. Uh, so those were not there in the previous version. So 
it will be quite uh, uh, useful for design engineers, plumbing design engineers. Same thing can be applicable for, is applicable for sanitary drainage chapter. Rainwater management, as I say, this is a new chapter. Uh, rainwater harvesting is usually the term we use for that in the requirements, how to plan. Uh, here is, there's something that I mentioned, licensing of plumber. This is not there in practice in, in our country, but hopefully if we have the BBRA, uh, in, in reality, if BBRA is established, then BBRA will uh, BBRA has the responsibility to license all uh, technicians like plumbers. So, uh, fuel and gas supply use of LPG is something new that is um, included in this new version of the code. Now, part nine, part nine is related to add alteration, addition to, and change of use of existing buildings. This is more, more related to administrative stuffs like uh, applicability and implementation, evaluation and compliance, and conservation. Uh, so, uh, there is a um, clause for evaluation. So, you can apply for making change in your building, but it has to go through an evaluation process to check if the safety is not compromised. If safety is not compromised and the performance, desired level of performance are achieved, uh, then uh, you may get the permission for the change or alteration. But at the same time, conservation issues are there. So these things are addressed in this chapter. So, I won't go into the details of this, I'll just skip them. So, conservation, uh, like, conservation is the process of retention of existing buildings or group of buildings, landscape, etc., and taking care not to alter or destroy a character or detail, even though repairs or changes may be necessary. For example, for a very old mosque or temple, uh, if we want to have repair, but at the same time, we want to uh, retain the historical value of that structure, how to do that. So, uh, those provisions are there in this chapter. So, uh, there are guidelines, I'll just skip. And part 10 is uh, about science and outdoor display. There, there are three chapters uh, and they're basically safety provisions. Uh, for these uh, signs, different types of signs. Uh, we, for example, if we want to have a, an outdoor sign outside the building, we can have it, but we may have to uh, have a permission from the authority. When uh, that will we can that will be exempted. It's also given there. Uh, so most of the time, we need to have a permission to have an outdoor display, things like that, where we cannot have signs or outdoor display, these things are written there. Different types of signs uh, are classified and safety provisions for those signs are given in the code. So that's it, the, this has been a small tour through the table of contents of the new BNBC 2020. I can understand this has been quite boring for you, but we felt that everyone should, all the engineers should have an overall idea of the code. That's it. So my time is going to be up. <laughs> I conclude here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Thank Dr. Raki. We were exactly on time. We are open for questions, uh, how to exactly handle, I, I think what will happen is Pro will display the questions that have come in on the screen. Everybody will see them. Uh, I will try to answer them. If I cannot, I will defer to Dr. Rakib. Uh,
I, I think that probably will be the best way to handle it. Okay, what are the questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then I, I will read what I have uh, and, and everybody listening, you feel free to type in questions. This is a, an important part of the seminar. Uh, I have only two questions as Pro said. One is very short, under reinforced concrete is good for column with a question mark. <laughs> The, the, the answer is yes. Uh, let, let, let me explain a little bit. When, when you have a lot of reinforcement in a column, it is definitely stronger. But the problem is that uh, if it gets overloaded for whatever reason and it fails, the failure will be explosive. It will be without any warning. If you don't have a lot of reinforcement, failure will be gradual and with warning. So that that is a huge part of why we do not want to load any concrete member, beam or column or whatever, with a lot of reinforcement. Uh, sudden failure without warning is a problem. Also, in earthquake situations or similar situations, the ability to, so strength is one thing, but, but how long can strength be sustained? You, a, a column has high strength, you push the column sideways, it, it begins to, uh, to move sideways. Is it able to sustain the high load that it is carrying? If it can, uh, uh, <laughs> for a long range of displacements which are inelastic displacements which are not recoverable that is the best then we have what we call ductility that comes from uh, a low amount of reinforcement if you have a lot of reinforcement you do not have ductility the load cannot be sustained over any significant displacement so for for those reasons uh, less reinforcement is better than more reinforcement. Okay, then there is a long, it is a question or a comment, I'm not sure. Uh, success of BNBC 2020 largely depends on proper involvement of all stakeholders, including landowners. That, that's absolutely true. As there is lack of publicity and awareness of BNBC 2020 among general people, the landowners who are planning to construct buildings are not at all concerned about it. When the structural engineer tells them about setback issues or safety issues during construction, most of them try to ignore those. How these issues would be ensured among the landowners in the days to come. So this is where our public awareness campaign comes in. We have a very significant campaign planned uh, that is going into effect as I speak. Uh, and we, we, we will try to create a situation where the public will have awareness that violation of building code is in nobody's interest. It is not definitely in the interest of the occupants of the building who, who may be renters. It is also not in the interest of the owner. Uh, it, it, so that, that kind of education, we will try to do what we can. We will try to make the public awareness campaign sustainable so that it continues after our project is over. Uh, whether we can target something specifically at owners, we will have to consider. I, I think that will be kind of difficult. The next question I have, 
post-stressed concrete structures are not included in structure with three question marks. I, I do not exactly understand the question. So post-stressed concrete, I think you mean post-tensioned concrete. So, so when we talk about concrete, concrete can be plain concrete, reinforced concrete or pre-stressed concrete. There are basically three divisions. Plain concrete is not necessarily concrete without reinforcement. It has less reinforcement than the minimum prescribed by the code. Reinforced concrete is not pre-stressed, conventionally reinforced. Pre-stressed concrete where we we, we uh, deliberately stress a concrete member before it is subject to external loading for very good reasons can be pre-tensioned. We, we, we apply the pre-stress before the member becomes part of the structure or it can be post-tensioned. We, we apply the pre-stress after the structural member is already part of the structure. I think you are talking about post-tension concrete. It definitely is included when we talk about concrete. It includes plain, reinforced, as well as pre-stressed concrete. And pre-stressed concrete includes pre-tension concrete as well as post-tension concrete. All of that is included. And, and and is regulated by the code. Okay, that's all the questions I see. Uh, Dr. Rakib, you probably have a bunch. Uh, please read them. And, and if you think they are meant for me, <laughs> I, uh, just ask me to answer them. Otherwise, please answer them. Okay, sure. Uh, yes, I have uh, many questions <laughs> in the question and answer box and some questions in the chat box too. So first I'll start with the question answer box. Uh, the first question is, without any or minor addition or alteration, should an existing building assessment follow the new code or the code in effect when the building was constructed or approved, particularly for two scenarios, A, from a forensic engineering perspective after a building fails, B, for assessment of the existing building as per authority, client, buyer's requirement. I'm not very clear about the question. It seems that uh, should there be an assessment of a building, existing building, if that building is not, does not go through, go through uh, any alteration. In that case, actually, in the building code, uh, there is no provision for assessment other than uh, this type of alteration. But but the building official has the right to assess any building if uh, the building official uh, thinks that the building may be unsafe. Uh, Dr. Kosh, would you like to comment on this question? I, I somehow <laughs> was looking at my Q and A, so I didn't quite listen to. If you read it again, please, I will try. Okay. Yeah. Uh, without any or minor addition or alteration, mm -hmm. should an existing building assessment follow the new code or the code in effect when the building was constructed or approved? Particularly for two scenarios: A from a forensic engineering perspective after a building fails, B, for assessment of the existing building as per authority client buyer's requirement. Uh, I heard you say that the question isn't very clear and I, I, I would repeat that. Uh, I, I will only repeat that when a new code comes out that does not render existing buildings any less safe than they were before the new code came out. And so if you have not been concerned about your building before the new code come out, there is no new concern that should enter your mind. Okay? So it is only when you add to your building 
or alter your building that you should worry about the new code. Uh, so that that is the short answer and if you have more in mind you will have to write back thank you the next question is uh, is very important one actually since we have a building code why additional vidimala is required very, <laughs> very good question uh, you see building one important difference between vidimala and building code is that building code is for the entire country Bidhimala, for example, Imarat Nirman Bidhimala is applicable within the jurisdiction of Rajuk only. For different development authorities, they have different rules, building rules. Now, that is one thing. Another thing is that building code is entirely is only about technical things. Uh, there's uh, very few administrative or enforcement related things, only particular to the building code. But, for example, suppose um, uh, Rajuk, what process should Rajuk follow in uh, giving permission to a building or uh, providing the permits? So those are described in detail in the Bidhimala. But I admit that the present Bidhimala has many repetitions of the code, uh, which actually do not have any particular meaning, at least to me. So that is right. You are right <laughs> in that sense. Prakash, uh, do you want to say something about this? Yeah, one of our uh, major recommendations to Rajuk is that when the Bidhimala is redone to be based on the 2020 BNBC, there be no repetition of anything covered by the BNBC. Repetition is unnecessary. Uh, in addition, it causes the problem that if something in the code is not repeated exactly as it is in the code, then there is confusion in the mind of the owner. So hopefully our recommendation will be accepted and there will be no repetition of BNBC provisions in the Bidhimala. Bidhimala should give you uh, administrative requirements if the code calls for inspection, what should be those inspections? When when does a building have to be inspected? That is the proper role of the Vidimala. How to construct using the BNBC. So administrative provisions, etc., etc. But no repetition of BNBC provisions. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Rakhi. Okay. Yes. Uh, the next question is, BNBC 2020 refers to registered professionals and licensed professionals without defining the term. Can you please clarify minimum eligibility criteria of a professional as per BNBC 2020 and also which entity, if any, should acknowledge the years of experience mentioned in the code? As for example, if a structural design professional Civil engineer just have eight years plus after his graduation. He is eligible for structural design of category four building by default. A very good question. You are right, absolutely right, that uh, this is not clear from the code that uh, what should be the registration or licensing process for the professions. Those things are not elaborated in the code, but mm, in uh, part two, uh, uh, in the chapter of establishment of the authority, in that chapter, uh, this is the responsibility of the authority, BBRA, uh, to, uh, to articulate the registration or licensing process. Having said so, uh, it is actually uh, the authority, relevant authority. For example, within the jurisdiction of Rajuk, Rajuk has the right to decide uh, about the uh, eligibility criteria and uh, their definitions of professions like uh, uh, what is what should be the definition of engineer or architect or um, that is there in the code for example engineers are actually those professionals who have membership with IEB so uh, and uh, there are some more criteria so those definitions are there. 
Dr. Ghosh, would you like to say something about this? Yeah, the only thing I would like to say is that I suspect the registered structural registered engineer and uh, licensed engineer terms are carried over from foreign codes and standards on which uh, BNBC is based. Bangladesh does not have established registration or licensing. Uh, those terms are pretty much synonymous. Uh, the International Building Code still uses the term registered uh, engineer. Some people feel that that is not the correct term because engineers like, like medical professionals have to be licensed to practice, so the term should be licensed structural, licensed engineer, but both mean the same thing. Uh, some kind of registration will probably be coming to Bangladesh at some stage, but right now what you have is what Dr. Akib mentioned. Uh, uh, Rajuk has a list of enlisted professionals and they are kind of the equivalent of the registered or the licensed engineer within Rajuk's jurisdiction. Uh, the next question is actually related to these, uh, uh, but I ha I think uh, Dr. Koch has already answered that. So um, one uh, one if one wants to practice within Rajuk's jurisdiction, uh, he or she has to be enlisted. Uh, only having eight years of experience will not uh, uh, give him the authority to sign any design. So that that the the next question was related to that. So I just skipped that and I tried to answer it. Uh, the next question uh, from your speech: It is clearly understood that building officials will be assigned to enforce the regulations of building code under the guidance of BBRA. My question is: When and how BBRA are going to be formed? Uh, uh, BBRA uh, can be formed through uh, a law. So there has to be a law uh, to establish BBRA, a new law. Any authority is established through a law, an act. So we have to wait for that. There has to be a law which will be passed through parliament and only in that case we can have a BBRA. Next question is uh, question part 7, chapter 5. I am doing assessment of new and existing industrial buildings. It's often found that the existing structure initially has very low factor of safety, but the owner has extended the stru structure vertically, resulting retrofitting of all structural elements. By code, do you have any benchmark or limit condition to rehabilitate any structure or we can do anything to a structure from a uh, poor factor of safety structure to a multi-story as long as the BNDC permits. Please, please see the new uh, new uh, uh, yes chapter five of part seven in conjunction with part nine. There will find that there are some new provisions. What load should be considered while assessment of a garment factory building? and while retrofitting what load should be considered. These are given there. But by retrofitting, if it is possible, technically possible, there is no limit that you cannot uh, go for uh, multi-story building. Uh, I think so. Dr. Ghosh? Well, the, the, the structure, the existing structure has to be assessed. If, if, if there is a three-story structure and the foundation and the structure are strong enough that you can build another six stories on top, by all means. But, but if the foundation is for a three-story building or a four-story building, you cannot build nine or ten stories. That goes without saying. So, so the, the assessment has to be done. It has to be possible. And if it is possible to do, then there is no limit, as Dr. Rakib said. Uh, 
So, uh, so it, it's always good to stick to the basics. You you cannot build vertically unless you have the right foundation, and 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 the structure you are building on will not collapse under the weight of the additional construction. It is not only the weight; as height goes up, wind becomes more and more of a problem. There is more overturning due to wind, even forgetting about earthquakes and things. So you have to be you have to be careful. But but <laughs> as Dr. Rakib said, there is no code imposed limit. Uh, Dr. Bosch, I have a lot more questions, but I think uh, we have run out of time. Okay. So okay. Can, can we have a record of these questions and answer them uh, yes. Yes. Afterwards, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Uh, I'm. Uh, no, we we can get a record of the questions. I'm pretty sure. I I will have Pro speak to that. Is that correct, Pro? We can print the questions, right? Okay. Uh, so so that's what we'll do. We we will uh, print the questions up and try to answer somehow and post the answers on. Uh, the website where you registered. I have a question in my Q&A box. Maybe I will try to answer this one so that we don't have to worry about my. So if two shear walls are in series pattern in a structure, it's found that connecting beams, which are in between those shear walls, face. Is there any special suggestion for those beams? Then he gives typical sizes. Uh, the the so if if there are two shear walls with beams between them, you say the beams fail. Uh, this is this is called a coupled wall system. Coupled wall system. They are actually better than having shear walls without beams in between. If you have a coupled wall system the beams actually should be designed to fail before anything happens to the shear walls. Let, let me go a little bit. I, I know I know it is beyond regulation time, but, but this is an important topic. So when two shear walls are linked by beams at every floor level, the shears at the ends of those beams, the shear forces add up to tension in one of the walls, compression in one of the walls. The couple due to this tension and compression forces resist part or much of the overturning moment due to wind or earthquakes, leaving only the remainder of the overturning moment to be resisted by the shear walls themselves. So this way, by letting the beams suffer the damage, we spare the shear walls from earthquake damage well into an earthquake. This is a very good thing to do. This is a very good thing to have. So, so couple shear walls are encouraged, particularly in earthquake situations. We have treatment, particular treatment for them in uh, the, as Dr. Rakib mentioned, BNBC 2020, which is now coming into effect, is already outdated because it was done in 2010. In, in later editions of, of US standards, we have treatment of, of a couple shear walls uh, that, that, that will benefit you. So, so this, is, this is a good question. Uh, I'm not sure the whole implication of the question was understood by the questioner, but but couple shear wall system, look those up maybe on the internet and you will have an appreciation. Uh, and and there was another one, Maria, can you bring that up? It was, it, it said it was meant for Dr. Rakib. There was another underneath that. Okay. Yeah, uh, actually there are two. I'll, 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 so I have a question to Dr. Rakib, sir. After Gazette on February 11th of BNBC 2020, code is mandatory to practice with a question mark. That is what I understand. That That is true, Dr. Rakib, right? Yes, so, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. So that's an easy answer. And then I see another question. If an existing building is overstressed due to load, 
prescribed in BNBC 2006 and remediation is required. Should the remediation be done using uh bnbc 2020 yes you you have to use the code at the time you you do your rehabilitation retrofit whatever maybe i have more questions than i thought <laughs> okay so so we will do with both uh, the, the question and answer boxes dr rakibs and mine we will print them out and we will try to answer them to the be be a little patient because you know everybody has only so much time but we will try to answer them so with, with that i thank everybody for your attendance i counted i think 336 was the peak and i understand i don't know how many but some were unable to register so we, we will we will try to solve that problem to the best we can uh, i thank dr akib for for his part of the presentation it was i i benefited from it i would like to thank uh, maria eglipe of our staff and pro das gupta who uh, ran this thing <laughs> and uh, it wasn't easy uh, anyhow, I, I think for the first one, it has gone off well. I was afraid of technical <laughs> problems. That hasn't happened. The sound has seemed to work. So so we are hoping for the best. Dr. Rakib has a whole module tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it. So, so same time tomorrow, uh, 7 in the evening in Dhaka, we will start again. Uh, thank you very much for attending.